Okay, if you have your Bibles, we are going to turn to Acts chapter 23. Acts chapter 23. Uh, this is our Sunday morning uh, sermon uh, for the 18th of September 2022. Uh, let's continue to pray for Bradford Family Glenn Services. It'll be this Thursday, 11 a.m. at Cornerstone. Uh, continue to pray for Andy as he deals with uh, looking for God's will and in and handling of cancer diagnosis, and we just want to pray. For that, we do have our children's program at WANA starting Sunday nights at 5 o'clock. We are doing evening Bible studies going through 1 Corinthians at 6.30 Sunday nights. Wednesday, we're going through Chronicles at 7 o'clock. And those are great Bible studies that are open to you and available to you. We encourage you to attend and, and get deeper into the Word. And that's what we're trying to do here. So let's pray and we'll get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your blessings on this day. Continue to pray for Andy, the Bradford family. Continue to pray for our Awana program. Pray for our Bible studies, our shoe boxes as October draws near, our Christmas boxes as December draws near. We just continue to, God, ask you to have your hand upon each and every ministry. Pray for our missionaries and just pray, Lord, for your study today. Let it be a blessing to us in Jesus' name. Okay, so we have a lot to cover uh, in this uh, lesson today. We're going to start in the middle of chapter 23. We left off uh, around verse 22. Let's go ahead and, and start there. Remember last week, uh, Paul was arrested. He was uh, found to be um, a Roman citizen. And so he was giving his defense. And we really focus on this last week in verse one of chapter 23, where it says, men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. So we really focus on the fact that our salvation, our, uh, the washing away of our sins, allows us to stand before God uh, redeemed and saved. And we're not perfect in the flesh, but in the eyes of God, our position in Christ is complete salvation. Our sins as far as the east is from the west, God says he remembers them no more. So we stand before our God with a clear conscience when it comes to the payment for sin. Jesus paid that price. Well, Paul then perceived that the Sadducees and Pharisees were in this group together. And they had a tremendous disagreement. Uh, the Pharisees believed life after death. Sadducees did not. And so Paul brings up in verse six that I am being judged based on the resurrection of the dead. That sent these two groups into a turmoil. And Claudius Lysias, the commander, had to rescue Paul, this Roman commander, from these two Jewish groups, uh, fearing they were going to tear Paul in pieces, the Bible says. And so that brings us to verse 22. What happened was these 40 men vowed not to eat or drink until they killed Paul. And they uh, kind of made a deal with the priests that they would call for Paul to be questioned one more time. And as the commander brought Paul out of his protection, uh, they would kill him. <laughs> but because God already had a plan, if you look at 23 verse 11, God tells Paul to be of a good cheer. For you have testified for me in Jerusalem, you must also bear witness in Rome. So God makes a promise to Paul that he's going to get to Rome. And that's, that, that is a, a guarantee. So then in verse 12, these 40 men band together with this vow. But God protects Paul and that his nephew hears this plot, gets the news to the commander, and then the commander let the young man depart in verse 22. And then verse 23, he prepared two centurions saying, prepare 200 foot soldiers, 700 horsemen, 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea the third hour of the night and provide mounts to set Paul on and bring him safely to Felix. So he was going to sneak him out in the middle of the night with all of this protection and take him to Felix, which is about a uh, 25 to 40 mile trek. And that was God's tremendous protection. So now, Claudius, if you look at verse 6, 26, Claudius Lysias, this is the commander that went and rescued Paul, so to speak, from this uh, mob. 
he writes a letter to Felix because he's going to kind of pass the buck to a little higher court. And he says, to the most excellent governor, Felix, this is verse 27. So he sends Paul away with this letter to Felix. This man was seized by the Jews about, that was about to be killed, coming with the troops. I rescued him. I want you to notice as we read this letter, how many times Claudius uses the word I. He says, this man was seized and I rescued him, having learned he was a Roman. And I wanted to know the reason they accused him. I brought him before the council. I found out that he was accused concerning the question of their law, but had nothing charged against him deserving of death or chains. And when it was told me that the Jews lay in wait for the man, I sent him immediately to you and also commanded his accusers to state before you the charges against him. So in this letter, we see a lot of eyes and Claudius puts himself in a pretty uh, good light. He leaves out the part that he was about to scourge a Roman citizen without having a trial and that he actually thought Paul was some Egyptian uh, assassin. And he leaves out that there is tremendous turmoil. Instead, he writes this letter to Felix in a very uh, self uh, uplifting way. Um, and the world and the courts of the world, one of the things he says is that, that he is being accused concerning their law. So there, there's a whole different set of handling of disputes within the church than there is within the law. And He's going to take this to the law. Paul is being brought by these Pharisees and Sadducees and the priests to the Romans. And, and we have to be careful about it. I'd like you to turn, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And we're not going to spend a lot of time um, breaking these verses down because they're very uh, self-explanatory. But let's look at it. it says in chapter one, uh, verse one of chapter six in first Corinthians. Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints. So Paul is writing and warning the Corinthian church not to bring in the outside ungodly or unbiblically educated or unchristian world to settle the abuse within a brother and sister in Christ. Verse 2 says, do you not know the saints will judge the world? If the world will be judged by you, you are unworthy. You are, are, you not, uh, are you unworthy to judge smallest of matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then you have judgments concerning things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge? I say this to your shame. It is so that there is not a wise man among you, not even one who will be able to judge between his brethren. But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers, exclamation point. Therefore, it is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Why would you not rather accept wrong? Why would you rather let yourselves be cheated? No, you yourself do wrong and cheat, and you do these things to your own brethren. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkenness, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such are some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the spirit of God. He says, look at the ungodly can't stand in judgment against the godly. He doesn't understand the principles of forgiveness, the principles of, of, of esteeming others higher than yourself. He says, it's better for you to allow yourself to be cheated than to take a brother in Christ before an unrighteous court because they don't know what to do with it. They don't know what to do with, with these principles of, of 
self-sacrifice and these principles of complete forgiveness. The world doesn't get it. The world has things like closure and, and paying back and vengeance. Well, God is very clear that vengeance is his. And so as we go back to the, the book of Acts, this violation right away of bringing uh, the, this, this Christian or the Roman court and the Roman court, like says, I don't even know what to do with this guy. The laws he broke are according to their laws. So he writes this letter to Felix and the soldiers in verse 31, back in Acts 23, as they were commanded, took Paul, brought him by night to Antipatris. This is the city, again, about 25 to 40 miles away. The next day, they left the horsemen to go on with him and return to the barracks. And so the soldiers were no longer needed. From They're getting to Caesarea. And so about 25 miles away is this little town called Antipatris. Well, between Jerusalem and Antipatris, there are a lot of Jews, and there is still worry. From Antipatris to Caesarea, it's, it's less dangerous, so they don't need quite as many soldiers. But they came to Caesarea in verse 33 and delivered the letter to the governor. They presented Paul to him, and the governor had read it and asked what province he was from. And when he understood he was from Cilicia, he said, I will hear you when your accusers have come. And he commanded him to be kept in Herod's praetorium. So Felix doesn't really want to deal with this situation, but it is from his region of, of um, Cilicia. So he has to hear it. Now, here's what the historian uh, Tacitus says about this Roman, his uh, Felix. He says, Felix was a master of cruelty and lust who exercised the powers of a king with the spirit of a slave. He spent most of his life as a slave, but one of his brothers kind of moved up in the Roman uh, regime, and he recommended Felix, and Felix was brought, trained, and now he got this position. And his main job is to maintain order, and that's really what's happening with Claudius and Felix. Uh, what they don't want is a riot. They don't want murder in the streets. They especially don't want the Jews murdering a Roman citizen. And so he was hoping not to have to do this. Claudius kind of passes the buck. And now Paul is going to stand before Felix, this kind of wicked, lustful, uh, angry king. But he's interesting, married to a Jewish woman. And so chapter 24, we're going to look at this life of Felix. And this life of Felix may have some similarities to your walk in life. It may not, but he might. Well, let's go to verse 1, chapter 24. After five days, Ananias the high priest came down with the elders and a certain orator named Tertullius. They gave evidence to the governor against Paul. So it's been about five days now. Uh, since they took Paul. So it's been about five days. I, I would imagine these 40 men are getting hungry with the vow that they vowed not to eat or drink until they killed Paul. Uh, but I would be more likely to guess they broke their vow. And there's ways to break a vow under the you know, Jewish regime. Basically, if it was made mistaken or all kinds of different things. But I'm sure they broke their vow. If not, they're five days now they're probably getting hungry and they're not going to kill Paul because we already know Paul is going to Rome just like we can don't have to fear what man does to us even if the man takes our life we're absent from the body and present with the Lord so they bring in this orator now an orator is a high-priced lawyer they're bringing out the big guns and I'm sure they paid him quite a bit of money uh and um he was probably a Hellenistic Christian from Greece. Um, kind of betrays his history, it seems to be that. But he reminds me a little bit of, uh, of I can remember the O.J. Simpson trial years ago and Johnny Cochran. His eloquence of the glove doesn't fit. He must have quit. He had celebrity status and he was so 
clever in his defense uh, that O.J. Simpson was found innocent, whether he was in the courtroom side, but he certainly was an orator. Uh, he spoke well, eloquently, clever little sayings, um, and he was very high priced. Well, this is Tertullus. This is the same type of guy. And if you look at his uh, accusations, you'll see this. In verse 2, when he was called, Tertullus began his accusation, saying, verse 2 of chapter 24, and I'm going to read this kind of in, in not mocking it, but in the light of, of how he would probably speak. He was very eloquent, an orator is how the Bible was right. And he says, seeing, verse 2, that though you were enjoying great peace and prosperity is being brought to this nation by your foresight. We accept it always in all places, most noble Felix with all thankfulness. So the first thing he does is he schmoozes Felix or he kisses up to Felix or he compliments him in, in, in his flattery. All right, seeing that through you, we enjoy great peace. Oh, you are so fantastic. You are so great. And he says, verse four, nevertheless, not to be tedious to you any further, I beg you to hear by your courtesy a few words from us. Oh, please, if you just allow us to say a few words. We have found this man a plague, a creator of dissension among the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, and we seized him wanted to judge him according to our law. But the commander Lysias came by with great violence, took him out of our hands, commanding by his accusers to come to you. By examining yourself, you may ascertain all these things of which we accuse him. And the Jews also assented, maintaining that these things were so. We give this beautiful, eloquent, oratory speech praising King Felix for all that he's done, um, and then accusing Paul of basically three things. He called him in verse 5, a creator of dissension. Well, Paul was not the creator of dissension. He was simply in the temple going through the purification process, and the Jews came and took him, and they falsely accused him of bringing a Gentile into the temple. Uh, he wasn't raising the dissension. He called them a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. Well, he was a preacher of the gospel. And he was a teacher of the way, the truth, and the life of Jesus Christ. And many people call Christianity a sect. Christianity is not a sect. Christianity is not even a religion. Right? To be a Christian is to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. When we gather together, we gather together to praise the name of Christ. Uh, it's not a cult. It's not a sect. The Bible teaches very clearly that God created the heavens and the earth. And a Christian is one who trusts in the scripture. So we learn from the scripture that God created everything, including us. And that mankind failed God by eating the forbidden fruit in Genesis. And sin, because of the sin of Adam, every human being is born with sin. That's pretty obvious. None of us are perfect. We say that all the time. Even the world would admit nobody's perfect. But the problem is to get to heaven, you must be perfect. So God establishes this law in the Old Testament to teach us that we are in, in, incapable of being perfect. And the problem is the wages or the payment for sin is death, Romans 6.23. But Romans 5.8, the key verse, God demonstrates his love towards us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart he's risen from the dead. You say, that's Christianity. Christianity is simply the, a title labeled um, uh, those who believe they need a Savior. They need Jesus Christ. We are commanded by God to spread this message to the whole world. The world doesn't like it in many times, and they call it a sect, and they call it even worse things than that. But Paul was doing nothing more than we were doing. And then the third thing in verse 5, uh, verse 6, he says he tried to profane the temple. 
Well, he didn't profane the temple. They accused him of bringing a Gentile in and he didn't do that. And so those are the three accusations. He's innocent of all of them. He wasn't the creator of dissension, the Jews were. Uh, he was not the leader of a sect. He is simply a believer in the way, the truth, and the life. And he didn't profane the temple because he didn't bring. In fact, he was in the temple going through the purification process to show his commitment to Moses and the law. Well, that's the accusation. And that is the same thing that would happen to us. The Bible says in Revelation 12, verse 10, listen to these verses. As I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, salvation and strength and the kingdom of God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of the brethren who accused them before God day and night has been cast out. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, praise God, by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives to death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. Praise God, we have been given victory by the blood of the Lamb. It's in the name of Jesus Christ, it's, it's incredible. Uh, but the Bible says Satan accuses us all day long. It's all he does is, is uh, accuse you of these things, being a dissenter, following a sect, being a sinner. Labeled with a little bit of truth. We are sinners, but we've been saved by the blood of the Lamb. We love that. Um, so Paul then speaks for himself and you know, we're going to see quite a few of these defenses and his defenses are always kind of laden with the gospel so verse 10 we'll walk through this he says Paul and the governor had nodded to him to speak and he answered inasmuch as I know that you have been for many years a judge of this nation I more cheerfully answer for myself so, He's not flattering. He's just thanking Felix for this opportunity to speak. Because you may ascertain that it is no more than 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem. So verse 11 said it's only been 12 days. It's been 12 days. Um, and they neither found me in the temple disputing with anyone nor inciting a crowd, either in the synagogues or in the city. Nor can they prove these things which they now accuse me. But this I confess to you that according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. Remember that verse. Paul says this is very simply, I'm just following the Bible. This sect is really the way. So he's defending himself against these charges. The first one is, I didn't, there's not one witness here that saw me inside a riot. I was in there doing the purification. That's number one. Number two, I'll defend myself in this way. I'm not the leader of a sect. I'm a follower of the way. There's a big difference. I believe everything written in the laws of Moses, which would agree with what the Jews and the priests. Verse from 15 says, I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. This being so, I always strive to have a conscience without offense towards God and men. Okay, this is really a question of the resurrection. And that question of the resurrection is important because that's what divided the Pharisees and the um, Sadducees. Meanwhile, Herculius is over here accusing this man creating a riot and, and that they were about to judge him according to their law until Claudius came in and, and took him away. That's a lie. It's the opposite. They were inside the riot. Claudius was the one who protected them and stopped the riot by taking Paul out. Now, Paul is just explaining that this is all about the resurrection of the dead. He says, now, after many days, I came to bring alms and offerings to my nations, he says in verse 17. In the midst of which some Jews from Asia found me, purified me in the temple, neither with mob or tumult. I wasn't creating, I was just going into the temple to purify myself. 
I was bringing this offering, minding my own business. They ought to have been here to object if they had anything against me. You know, if anybody saw me create a riot, why aren't they here? They've had 12 days to gather witnesses and they don't have any. It's their word against mine. Or else let those who are here themselves say if they found any wrongdoing in me while I stood before the council. Unless it is for this one statement which I cried out, standing among them concerning the resurrection of the dead, I am judged by you this day. He says, look, at what they're really upset about is that I said I believe in the resurrection of the dead. What the world really is upset about is when we preach the truth that Jesus is the way the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father except through him. That's really where the problem lies. So the idea here is, keep preaching the truth. The world will not be happy with it. But enough will hear. I, I heard a testimony at the Alpha dinner this week. That they shared the gospel 197 times in this past fiscal year. 197 times. And there were seven decisions for Christ. Now, that doesn't sound like a very good percentage. Well, what a blessing when one person comes to God. So this resurrection of the dead, it, it, it's, it's, I want to read to you Daniel 12. This is really a blessing. Um, God is ending his um, uh, conversation with Daniel. Daniel's book is almost done. And God says in chapter 12, verse 1, At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of the people. And there will be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. So this is a prophetic verse of the tribulation to come in Daniel 12. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who was found written in the book. What's the book? Oh, we know it's the Lamb's Book of Life, don't we? And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. We know that the dead in Christ will rise first, and those who are alive will be gathered in the air. But also the, the, the dead who are not in Christ, they will stand before God at the great white throne, and God will see if their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's clear in Revelation. Those who are wise will shine like brightness of the firmament. Those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But I want you to look. Verse 2. Some awake to everlasting life and some to everlasting contempt. There is life after death. It's not just a New Testament idea. It was shared by Daniel himself. And when Paul says, I trust the law of the Moses, I trust the Old Testament. That's where he learned about this resurrection. And so for the Sadducees to speak against it when it's so clear in their own Old Testament that there's an everlasting judgment or everlasting reward coming to those when they die. Well, which side are you on? If you trust in Christ, then no one will pluck you out of his hand. But if you've not yet given your life to Christ, then you are in danger of facing that everlasting punishment. So Paul is done, and the response by Felix is an interesting one. When Felix heard these things, having a more accurate knowledge of the way, Paul is, is, is blessed by God here because he's speaking in front of a man named Felix who's married to someone who's Jewish and has an understanding of the way. Isn't that interesting? He adjourned the proceeds when Lysias, the commander, comes down. I will make a decision on your case. So he puts it aside. He's going to wait for Claudius to come down because right now it's Tertullus' version against Paul's version. But Claudius was there, so he's going to wait. And he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and let him have liberties and told him not to forbid any of his friends to provide or visit him. So he's basically under house arrest. Almost like I'm sure he didn't have a bracelet on his ankle back then, uh, but it's a similar uh, kind of sense. And friends could come and go, and he was safe. After some days, when Felix came with his wife Drusella, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning 
his faith in prayer. That so Felix is curious. He wants to hear what Paul has to say about Christ. Drusilla being Jewish. Now, now we know that from history that she is the daughter of Agrippa the king. And there, there's two Agrippas. There's one in chapter 25. Mary Jubilee. But there's also Herod Agrippa, who in Acts chapter 12 murdered James, arrested Peter. That's when Peter escaped. Went and knocked on the door, and Rhoda came to the door, and then Herod went and spoke great attitudes, and people said he was like a god, and God killed him on the spot. Um, most people believe that's her father. History states she has this background in in the way, and she's Jewish, and Felix has a knowledge of the way, and they are interested in. Paul's faith in Christ. And the Bible says, always be ready to give an answer for those who ask you about the hope that lies within you. Paul is using this opportunity. Anytime there's an open door, and every open door needs to be taken advantage of. Paul is not taking this time with Felix to beg to be let out, to cry against, why do you hold me for no reason? He's going to take this time and opportunity to share his faith. Verse 25 says he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and judgment. That's the gospel, right? We are not, not by our own righteousness, Titus 3, 5, but by the righteousness of Christ. That's what saves us. And self-control is, is, is making that decision or facing the judgment to come. And so he's talking to, to this man who's known for lust and sin and anger and even his wife, he took from another king because of his lust for her. Um, and so Paul is, is, is intimately speaking to him on these issues of his self-control and what is right. And of the judgment to come if he doesn't receive the way, the truth, and the life in Jesus Christ. Incredible. In fact, it goes because when Paul was saved in Acts chapter 9, one of the things God said about him was, that he's a chosen vessel of mine who would preach to the Gentiles and kings. And here he is speaking to noblemen. And eventually he's going to get the Roman son. Incredible. So he reasoned about the righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come. Felix was afraid and answered, Go away now, for when I have a convenient time, I will call upon you. One of the sadder verses in the Bible. He was afraid, so he was being convicted. But he sent Paul away for a more convenient time. There's no record at all. Felix, in fact, is, is done at the end of this chapter. He's only there for a couple of years. And um, he doesn't respond to that initial condition. He fights off it. Story from a preacher named Dr. George Pruitt. He was a pastor in Texas. They were celebrating his 50th anniversary. And there was a lawyer in town who was there honoring him for the work that he's done, who has known him from his early days. And George Pruitt's testimony is that the lawyer came to him and said these words. He said, Pastor, when I first heard you, I was moved by your sermons. There were nights when I could not sleep. As the years went by, I could listen to you without being bothered at all. And you are a much better preacher now than you were 50 years ago. He says, when I first heard you, some nights I couldn't even sleep. I was really moved and bothered by your messages. But over the years, he was able to quench that Holy Spirit. And that's what Felix is going to do. He's going to quench that Holy Spirit. Uh, I'm afraid. I fear what you're saying. I don't want to do anything. The Bible says, 2 Corinthians 6, 1, when then as workers together with him also plead with you to receive the grace of God, do not receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in an acceptable time I have heard you, 
in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. So God writes very specifically, don't receive the grace of God, the message of the gospel in vain. Don't say to God, well, when, when it's time, I'm just not ready. Someday I'll be ready. God says, no, you should be ready now. We don't know when the Lord's coming back. You don't know when your last breath on earth is going to come. You don't know what's going to happen to that conviction in your soul as you get farther and farther away. You stop going to church. And people say, I don't go to church because of this. I don't go to church because of that. I don't go to church because of this. There's one reason why people don't go to church, and that's the conviction of their spirit. They just don't want to hear it. The Bible says in John chapter 3, everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest their deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen. And so what that means is, is, is we as the body of believers filled with the Holy Spirit, we love church. We love being in, in, in fellowship with fellow believers and hearing the wonderful words of God and singing the hymns and singing the worship song that praise his name. But to those who are, are living in sin, those who are un, ungodly, those who are unsaved, it's convicting. And they push it away for a more convenient time. I'm begging you. There, this is the time. Today is the day of salvation. If you are considering reaching out to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, don't put it off. I'm begging you. Don't put it off. Because if you do, it's just going to kind of uh, flitter away. And your spirit will be quenched. Verse 26 says, Meanwhile, he hoped that money would be given him by Paul that he might release him. Therefore, he sent for him more often and conversed with him. So he wants a bribe. And he keeps inviting Paul, kind of dropping hints, I would think. Paul is using the opportunity to share his faith. But I, I will tell you, the more he pushes back against it, ignores it, the easier it gets. You just ignore it. So after two years, Portius Festus succeeded Felix, and Felix wanted to do a favor, left Paul bound, and that's done. Two years. I'm telling these, these 40 men are getting hungry, who have vowed not to eat or drink. Today is the day of salvation. That's the message. Don't wait for a more convenient time. Understand Satan accuses you night and day that you have God uh, standing for you on your behalf. But this message is for the Felixes out there. Those who are convicted, twinsed by the spirit. He was afraid. His lawyer was who couldn't sleep at night. That's how you're feeling today. Surrender. God. This will be the best thing you've ever done. Your eternity will be secure. Your life will be a life of more, it won't be perfect, but it'll have more peace, more calmness, and more purpose than you've ever had before. Heavenly Father, I pray for those who may be listening who have not accepted Christ as their Savior. Lord, that they would seize the day, so to speak. The day is the day of salvation. They wouldn't wait for a more convenient time. But wherever they're listening to this message, they would just simply surrender to you, admit to you, God, that they are sinners and they have a need of a Savior. And they want to trust in the Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life, the one who died on the cross, was buried in his grave. Oh, I pray, Lord, that soul would be saved uh, from the simple gospel presented on this silly little recording. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. Have a great day. And